Boys Booth with Bryce Coon. Hey, everybody, and welcome in to another Crowded Booth podcast. We're not live. You're watching this recorded over on YouTube. Zach McKinnell alongside me, Fly War Eagle, uh, the Blue Bloods College Football Podcast. We're excited to have him in. Make sure to hit the subscribe button down there in the bottom right corner. Notify yourself as well. Hit the little notifications button so you know when we go live, when the new video drops as well. Make sure to check us so you can see all the sponsors around, CrowdedBooth.com as well, where uh, we're going to make a pick tonight. But we also are going to uh, have our picks on Saturday morning released at thecrowdbooth.com. It's for a plethora of games, but Zach, uh, you went to Auburn. I'm from Columbus. There's one game in particular here this week that has a lot of meaning uh, between the Chattahoochee River, and that's Auburn-Georgia, the Deep South's oldest rivalry. Uh, First off, to have this with what is expected to be an an unreal crowd in Jordan here really we'll say the first full capacity crowd in Jordan Hare since 2019. Uh, I know they had just a couple home games, but those were some cupcakes. And now they got the real deal coming in, man. What's uh, how excited are you to have one of the best rivalries in college sports kind of rekindled here this year? Oh man, it, it's, it's going to be a different experience. I, I, I'm pretty sure they're doing one of the theme games too. I want to say it's the blue out, I believe, which is typically what we do for Georgia. Mm-hmm. I think the fans are going to come, come out in abundance and plus Auburn did a great job. We had a uh, tumors tip off tonight where they put a big basketball court in tumors corner. Bruce Pearl brought out the football team tonight and he was like, it's Georgia hate week and everyone got just loud and crazy. And so I'm assuming that we're going to see the type of env- environment that we saw in 2017. The mm. last time Georgia was a top two team came in there with all the hype. Auburn was coming off just a few weeks ago, losing to LSU in Death Valley, where they were up 20 to nothing. That was actually my senior year. And I'm going to be honest, (laughs) that game, even above the 2017 Iron Bowl, was probably my favorite game that I ever experienced as a student. I mean, it was so loud, it like messed with your heartbeat almost. And I think that's the type of energy that you're going to see, at least in the first half this weekend at Jordan Hare. Well, and two, I mean, obviously this is a game where students from Georgia can travel. It's going to be one of the shorter road trips for fans. And like we said, sprinkled in between Athens and Auburn, you have a ton of Auburn and Georgia fans, graduates. I know especially for here in St. Columbus, that's been the talk all week. I mean, I've, I've been out to eat for lunch. Ralph, my co-host on our live shows, was talking with us and – uh, he said, man, I went out to eat the other day and I was talking to tonight and he said, I had like four or five people come up and like, we're talking, hey, you ready for the game this weekend? And like, it's just one of those things. This is a big time game. And, and Zach, I think it's interesting to see because it's a big time game. It's a rank, two ranked opponents. You have a team, like you said, in Georgia that comes in highly regarded. I mean, this defense is, I, I, I said that at the end of the season, If it goes the way Georgia fans want it to go, you could be talking about a defense that's in the same conversation as 07 LSU, 2011 Alabama, 2012 Alabama. That's how good this group is. But you have an Auburn team that I, you know, they're number 18 in the country. They've looked really, really bad at times, and they've looked really, really good at times. And I know you've come on our live show and you've talked about it a little bit, but man, what is your overall synopsis of kind of the mood of Auburn? What do you think that if you had to say take the temperature of the locker room? A lot of times we go to the temperature of the fan base. Temperature of the locker room right now for Auburn because you like you said it's hype. It's Georgia Hate Week. This is a very big game in the midst of a very tough SEC schedule they have. I, I really think it's the highest it's been in a long time, to be completely honest with you. I don't think if you're not an Auburn fan and you didn't grow up in the program, I mean, I, I grew up a fan. I went to school there. I've been to two of the Death Valley heartbreaks. I was there when Leonard Fournette carried the entire Auburn defense on his back all day long. I was there when we blew the 20 to nothing lead, and I know that feeling coming out of the stadium. I had the cigars on me. I was ready to hmm. celebrate that that <laughs> overcoming they they the way they won last weekend was the biggest thing for me it's not just that they broke the streak um that was going on since 1999 i was two years old the last time that they won in death valley just to show you how long ago it was but it was that they over that overcame a 13 point deficit they had a defensive i guess awakening in the second half where they absolutely shut down LSU and they really shut down LSU since the first drive. I mean, Kayshawn Boutte, let's just be honest, is a star in college football and he was an X factor early, but for some reason LSU got away from that. And I don't know why, but I can only thank them for that. But 
the Auburn offense, though, as much turmoil as they, they face, Tank Bigsby, non-existent. Jarquez Hunter, non-existent till the last drive. The wide receivers dropping passes. The offensive line not playing well. For Bo Nix, the week after he got benched, the week that I would say 70% of the fan base wanted him to transfer to Jacksonville State. Uh, he carries this team to a win for the first time since 99 in Death Valley and does it in Johnny Manziel fashion. And mm -hmm. for me, I think the team has rallied around Knicks. I think the defense is getting healthy. Oh, for Owen Papo to be out last week and Auburn to do what they did against LSU's offense was extremely impressive. They get their emotional leader back in Papo. You know about how important he is mm -hmm. to the Auburn defense. Zacoby McLean's only getting healthier. You know, TD Moultrie may be out this weekend, but we'll see. I heard it might have been a COVID issue, so we'll see. But overall, I think the confidence is growing in Derek Mason. The confidence is growing in Bo Nix. Now, the only question mark is Tank Bixby, and if he just returns to full form this weekend, you're looking at an Auburn team that honestly right now probably believes they can beat anyone in the country after last week. That's a dangerous spot for Georgia. It's a dangerous place to play. The mystique of Jordan yep. Hare uh, is definitely there. I was in the building in 2017 wearing the red and black, and man, that was a rude awakening <laughs> for a team like this in Georgia that prided itself on the defensive side of the football. Now, I think this team's a little bit better defensively. They've got a better unit up front, but you talked a little bit about the run game for Auburn. Ralph said this, he believes that it might be one of the better running back rooms in the country that Auburn employs. And I don't think any of us would have said that beginning of the season because we didn't quite know what Jarquez Hunter was going to do. Obviously, you had Shivers, you had Biggs, but you know what you had there. But this running back room, how important is it going to be for the offensive line to establish to run early on, which is going to be very tough against a front seven. But to me, if you don't do it early on, that's not something, especially against an elite type of defense we're talking about in Georgia, that you can just, oh, eventually it'll happen. Because they've shown, Georgia's shown, even against some inferior competition, it's never really worked out for the opposition. Yeah, I mean, all you have to do is watch what happened to Arkansas last week when Georgia made them one-dimensional. That secondary is too good for you to just – for them to know you're going to have to throw the ball. Mm -hmm. One, they have the pass rushers. Let's just be honest. Jordan Davis running as fast as he does, as big as he is, so that fair. should be illegal. That should be it's illegal. Not, they, they, should make, they should make him wear ankle weights <laughs> to slow him down a little bit. N'Kobe Dean, I said, you know, in your comments on, on Tuesday's show, mm -hmm. I think N'Kobe Dean solidified himself as the best linebacker in the country. The yeah. I, I don't think there's a, a good argument. Maybe Suell at Oregon, but he's a little bit banged up over there. We'll, and he's young as well. But Keely Ringo and these corners and De'Aaron Kendrick and Tyke Smith possibly coming back this mm -hmm. weekend. Auburn's gonna have to run the ball. You know, there's been rumors. There's been rumors that Bigsby's banged up because the past two weeks, Georgia State and LSU, he has been. It's probably his two worst performances of his career mm -hmm. right now. So he's got to. We got to see what he brings. Maybe Auburn was saving him for this week. Maybe you know Jarquez was doing enough, but Jarquez is averaging ten yards per carry and leading Auburn in rushing. If I would have told you in August that the freshman three-star running back was going to be beating Tate Bigsby right now in yards and yards per carry, you probably would have been like, "I'm never inviting you on my show again." You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> or this but team wouldn't just have one it, loss. Exactly, exactly. And then also Shivers is someone who a lot of people are like, well, he disappeared. Well, he's been hurt. And mm -hmm. he made a huge impact down the stretch if you watch this Auburn offense coming out of the backfield. But for me, this running game is important, not only because you can't be one dimensional, but you just have to, when you look at this Auburn offense and you rank your top three playmakers outside of Bo Nix, I think the top three are Bigsby, Hunter, and Shivers. I don't think you trust a wide receiver, maybe Colby Hudson, maybe John, uh, John Shanker at tight end, but the running backs are the key to this Auburn team. For me, though, it's not that they're going to run the ball. It's how they run the ball. They have to be versatile in their attack. Georgia's too fast to beat to – they're going to beat you to the edge. The Kobe Dean and those linebackers are too good sideline to sideline. You're going to have to try to out-physical Georgia, which is a tough task. It's way easier said than done, mm -hmm. but also – my key to the game was to get them out in space and let them make plays in space because I think Bigsby, Hunter, and Shoppers have the athleticism and the strength to make plays against almost anyone in the country. I'm talking about slip screens. I'm talking about get them out in the flats. 
get get them on, you know, you know, just toss it out into space and let them go make a guy miss and make a play. Because right now, I don't trust the interior of the Auburn offensive line to dominate Georgia like we need. You just have to give your playmakers a chance, and that's all Mike Bobo has to do this weekend to get this Auburn offense going. Auburn has the athletes, uh, in my opinion, to be a top-tier offense, not only in the SEC but in the country. But a lot of it comes on the shoulders of Bo Nix, the guy who delivers the ball to those running backs, to the receiver, to the tight end. You know, I said on our live show a couple weeks ago, I said someone in that offensive line, a wide receiver, who's got to step up and really just say, if it's not going to be anyone else, I've got to take responsibility. We saw the tight end do that this past weekend, and I think that with Bo Nix coming off a performance that really – I don't want to overblow it, Zach, and say it was the biggest performance of his Auburn career. But with what was at stake this season, the program, and really just his future, it really – I mean, I don't think it's out of the question to say that was the performance that might have staked a claim of, is this the turning point? Is this where he finally, finally turns the corner? And listen, we're in an age of college football where it's, what have you done for me lately? And, and I get that. It's – Bo Nix is talented. A lot of people remember his first ever game in Jerry's world at, uh, against the Oregon Ducks. But that game in LSU, it showed, and to me it's solidified of why they chose Knicks, why they put him in there, and credit the coaching staff for sticking with him. But, man, all that to say, this is a different beast. We were saying before the show, yep. I don't know if you can run around like that. To me, it's going to have to be some quick hitters, five-yard outs, quick dig route, a slant, a screen pass, something that can be a quick hitter because I think if you start to spend too much time in the pocket, even with the elusiveness that Knicks has, Georgia has done a really good job when you go back on watching film of gang tackling. You see a lot of red hats near the football. Is that something that kind of worries you? Because it was it's fun to watch. The pass to Tyler Fromm is awesome. It's a highlight real play. But even Johnny Manziel struggled against some top tier defenses when he did that. And I don't not I don't think it's out of the question that Bo Nix is probably not as good as Johnny Manziel was in his college career. But does that worry you a little bit if Nix has to do without it too much? It kind of turns into a backyard style of football game, which we saw last year in Athens did not go well for Auburn. Yeah, I mean, when you look at the Georgia defense, I mean, what you can possibly count what six, seven guys that potentially could be first round picks at, at minimum. It's deep, yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's not even including the backups who haven't played yet that God forbid they get a chance to go out there, Sean. And, you know, Georgia's doing this, missing arguably three or four of their top ten players coming into the season. That's Mm -hmm. how scary this team really is. And their weakness was supposed to be the secondary, and Keely Ringo's allowed one catch. And on the other side, De'Aaron Kendrick's only allowing 30% of the passes toward his side to be caught. And that's without Tyke Smith, who was one of the Big 12 players of the year at safety, at, 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 at their nickel spot. That's that is the most ridiculous stat for Kirby Smart is the fact of how he has consistently recruited at Georgia. And Kirby Smart's always given Auburn problems outside of the one game in 2017, where Mm -hmm. really and truly, as an Auburn fan, if it went for like three plays going the opposite way, it wouldn't have been like that. You look at like the the Mm -hmm. flea flicker that went wrong, that should have been a touchdown, the wide open drop pass in the first quarter, which from hit the dude right in the chest and he dropped it for a touchdown. So let's pump the brakes. Kirby Smart has done well against this Auburn offense. But for me, Nicobe Dean's too good at linebacker. Tyndall's too good. Anderson off mm-hmm. the edge. I mean, and Jordan Davis up the middle. I don't think Auburn's seen a, you can combine all the talent from every team Auburn's played. I don't think it combines to what they're mm-hmm. going to see this weekend coming to the plains. And for me, Nick's under pressure is just a different quarterback. You've seen it time and time again, where if he's under pressure, it, he just turns into a different guy. He's only completing 35% of his passes when he's under pressure and grades below a 55 in passing grade by pro football focus when mm-hmm. he's under pressure. And I just have a feeling, man, it, as much as it'd be great to say, let's just have the offensive line step up the more likely scenario has to be Knicks has to be better under pressure because I just – there's no way Georgia doesn't get, you know, five, six, seven pressures just in the first half. Can you turn those, those you know, potential 10-yard losses into no gains, into a three-yard gain, into a five-yard gain? Just make it manageable because if you get into third and long situations against Georgia, they're going to come after you and – more often than not, as sad as it is to say, they're going to get you. 
because they're just mm -hmm. that talented. And Kirby Smart's that good of a blitz. Him and Brent Venables, I don't think people – someone needs to do a film breakdown on it. I might have to wait till the all season to do it. But Venables and Smart are the two best blitz – you know, the – they can dial up such a beautiful blitz. You mm -hmm. look at Venable's strategy against Tua in the national championship with the corner blitzes that just kill Tua's game. And then you look at what Smart did in the first half against Hurts against Alabama and how he was dialing up the pressure and how they were executing. I just have a feeling Auburn's good. There's no way to stop the pressure on Knicks. This is this is Knicks, you know, gut check. It was all fine and well what you did against LSU. But can you do it against an elite team that is going to arguably probably run away with the SEC East as of today? You, you said, uh, obviously, can you do it against the elite teams? And listen, that's what he's ultimately going to be measured by. Uh, the wins against these other opponents are fantastic. The win against LSU is a good, a great win since 1999. I was only two years old. I think you were as well. I mean, we were we were young bucks back then. Yeah. <laughs> but – for this game, it's what have you done for me lately? And you see how Gus Malzahn was was you know judged. That's great you won those games, but how did you do against Auburn and George Auburn and Alabama? I think Nick's has to be held the same standard for the quarterback position. So when you when you look at this, obviously defensively that's been the conversation. But I want to flip it here and I want to go to Auburn's defensive line. They've been good over, uh, against the the run. I think there were some holes against Georgia State that Georgia State you did a great job. And I said this in the live show. I think we have to stop saying. Well, Auburn's just not as good as we thought they were, and just give credit to the other team. They came in and executed their game plan, and they did it well. These are these are guys that are Division One football players. It's not like they're just you know random Joes. It's like not you and I out there playing. I mean, these are guys. This is what they do. So the Auburn defensive line, how tough is the task with a Georgia offensive line that you know there was a, some question marks coming into the Arkansas game, but then they go out and they do what they do. And right now, it just seems like Georgia can win a game however they need to. And Kirby Smart said this. Elite teams can adapt to whatever they need to do. Georgia's shown that ability so far. If they need to go back and throw the ball 40 times, they can. you feel like they can do that. Now, maybe with Stetson Bennett, the JT Daniels conversation is another one for another time. But how does this Auburn defensive line stack up against a formidable rush that's five running backs deep? Uh, the offensive line is loaded with five-star talent that has executed. I mean, what do you see when you look at that? Um, You know, for me, really and truly, I, I mean, I'll address the D-line, but for me, the biggest factor in the running game has been the linebackers for Auburn. Hmm. Because if people don't remember, Papo was out of the Georgia State game, but then people seem to forgot that McLean, Zacoby McLean, All-American linebacker, was also out. So Auburn had two guys who have never started a game come in at Georgia State. And when you look at the film, it was it was always their bust. I mean, they graded terribly against the run, and it was they didn't fit the gaps and didn't have the instinctive play that McLean and Papo, who are two All-American linebackers, had brought to the table. Auburn's going to have a huge benefit with getting both of those guys back healthy. I think Carson knew saving Papo last week for this week was a necessity because if you lose Papo last week for, let's just say, the season or something like that, you could have a mm -hmm. major issue moving forward. But the thing about the D-line is – you know, they stopped the run against Penn State, and that's what everyone looks at. But Penn State hasn't been able to run the ball against anybody. Yeah. I mean, they're they're averaging less than 100 yards rushing per game right now for the season for Penn State. They weren't able to run against Wisconsin. They haven't been they, they weren't able to run against Villanova. So for me, that wasn't <laughs> more about the Auburn D line than it was. I just don't think Penn State runs the ball very well. Noah Kane hasn't lived up to the hype. And really, a truly Sean Clifford and Jahan Dotson are the face of that team. Mm -hmm. And that you're just kind of seeing an identity change. And then I'm not taking any stats away from Akron and Alabama State. Alabama State had a first team all swack running back that they held out of the game because they knew it was a money game and wanted to save them for conference play. That's the type of stuff you get when you play yeah. smaller teams. And Akron's, let's, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't want to trash any program. They're Go ahead. It's okay. Let's, that, I mean, it's, they're they're atrocious. Bad. Uh, a team of me and you would maybe put up 20 against Akron. So <laughs> I'm just going to leave it at that. So for me, the one time you got tested was Georgia State, who is a running football team with a very physical offensive line, even for a group of five team. And they ran it down your throat for 230 yards. And on top of that, LSU is averaging 60 yards rushing per game right now, man. So was it Auburn's yeah. D line or was it just LSU being atrocious and running the ball and Max Johnson's averaging 300 yards a game. So are you going with Kayshawn Boutte and Max Johnson? Or are you going to try to run the ball with your mm -hmm. 
group of running backs who are unproven. I believe Kisner is their leading rusher, and he's not even the starting running back still yeah. today. So that just shows you. And he has 100 rushing yards, and he's leading the team in rushing. I just previewed that game, so that's why I know that stat <laughs> on the top of my head. But for me, Auburn's D-line, the pass rush is going to be way more important because – on top, I think the linebackers will hold down the run game, but can you get pressure on Stetson Bennett? I was hoping, you know, mm. as, as a college football fan, I was hoping Daniels came back. As an Auburn fan, very glad he's not in the game because he's he's, he's a much yeah. bigger test than Stetson Bennett. But last year, people forget Stetson Bennett picked Auburn apart last season in Athens, but they weren't able to get any pressure. Auburn had zero pass rush last year, and I don't believe they had a sack last season. They have to get to the have to get to the quarterback. Tony Fair and Marcus Harris, two transfers, uh, Harris from Kansas, Fair from UAB, have been really great additions to that offensive line. Um, also, Marquise Burks has been playing well. Colby Wooden off the edge has been playing well. Moultrie's a big loss. We'll see about him. But if those guys can get pressure to Bennett, he becomes a different quarterback. Mm-hmm. And so that's where I think they're going to have to eat. But man, when you look at this Bulldogs offensive line three sacks, one quarterback hit, and only 15 pressures through five weeks. And they have faced two top 10 teams already. Yeah. That's and a, they face what's arguably a – and, and I know Clemson's not what they thought offensively, but Clemson to me defensively is still one of the top defenses in the country. Obviously, they've lost a couple guys. But like you said, I mean, when you face competition like that, Zach, I mean, the numbers don't lie in, in that realm. I, I think Georgia does a good job, and I think Todd Munkin is starting. And, and obviously – they're a little bit hindered, and this is nothing against Stetson Bennett. He is – there are – I'll tell you, say this, there are – I could probably name 20 teams across the country that wish Stetson Bennett was starting for them. He's a talented oh, yeah. guy. He's a veteran. He knows what to do with the football, and also he knows his game. He doesn't go out there and and, and try to be the selfish guy that's going to say, well, I, I need the numbers. He does what's best for the team. But like I said, I think JT Daniels takes this offense to another level that they're going to need against an Alabama or someone else oh, in the yeah. country. But, but this game right here – uh, before I get into prediction, I'll, I'll ask you this, and you can go into the prediction off of this right here. Is it enough if Georgia comes in? Can they just lean on this defensive line and wear them down? Because I kind of think this game could be close in the first half, but I think the depth of Georgia, I mean, when you see Zamir White come out and now Kenny McIntosh comes in, Kendall Milton's going to be healthy for this game. I mean, yep. as a defense, you're just like, holy cow, and you start to see the defensive line hands on the hips. I mean, is that something that realistically could happen this game? Georgia could just wear them down in that front for seven? You know, I had a lot, I had a lot of pushback on our preview episode because, you know, our guys over at Flower Eagle retweeted my video. So shout out to MK and Andrew <laughs> for that. But I was like, y'all didn't want to retweet that one. I did. I, I, I That wasn't the video y'all needed to put out there for me. But um, I got a lot of pushback. But I see this going exactly like the Arkansas game because mm-hmm. I see Auburn and Arkansas, they're not – they're not perfect matches. They're similar teams. You have a quarterback mm-hmm. who has – they have a quarterback who's not very accurate, can throw the deep ball, and he's dynamic when under pressure. That's exactly mm-hmm. – and all it is is K.J. Jefferson is like three of Bo Nicks. That I mean, that's that's the real <laughs> well, Let's not lie. He's Cam Newton's size. I mean, that's what he is. Exactly. I know people love to throw that comparison, but he has that size. Exactly. And they have a three running back system with mm-hmm. Trey with, – with, 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 I believe it's Trayon Smith – and a mm-hmm. few other guys. And then on top of that, their offensive line is unproven, but they've done very well in run blocking, which the Auburn O-line has done really well in run blocking. And then on the defensive side of the ball, they they have a really stout linebacking core with Bumper Pool, uh, Henry, and all those guys. That's exactly what Auburn has. But they have an unproven D-line, and they have one secondary player in Jalen Catalan that's like a Roger McCreary that can be a shutdown guy, but the rest are unproven. It is the exact matchup we saw last week, in my opinion, and I think it's going to go down exactly the same. In my preview, I said Zamir White, Kendall Milton, James Cook, Kenny McIntosh, and probably the other five stars they got growing somewhere in the back <laughs> you know, closet. Are They're just going to get carry after carry after carry. Mm-hmm. And the underrated guy for me is James Cook. I think Ooh. he is the, he is the most overlooked running back in that, you know, in that backfield. So I had a friend. He's not a college football guy, really. He called me last week and he said, that guy looks j- runs just like Dalvin Cook. I was like, yeah, I bet he does because he's that's related his, to Dalvin. Older like, brother. <laughs> like, that's, his, that's his brother. Like, of course he runs. He was like, no, Georgia's third string running back is Dalvin Cook's brother. I was like, that's that's how good Georgia is. Yeah. And Auburn's D-line, it's, they're going to have to be put to the test. I mean, uh, what I imagine happening is if Georgia can have Stetson Bennett throw less than 20 passes, 
Kirby Smart will give the offensive game plan an A+. Hmm. They're going to try to run the ball 40 to 50 times right down Auburn's throat. They're going to try to win the time of possession battle, and they're going to try – they're going to – they're going to – Stetson Bennett's going to go to the locker room and they're going to ask if he played this week. That's that's what Kirby Smart <laughs> wants to do. And for me, outside of – and the other comparison for Arkansas that's important for Auburn this weekend is to wide receivers. Outside of hmm. Traylon Burks at Arkansas, I don't think many fans can name another wide receiver. For the Razorbacks yeah. right now, and, and really before the season or before last season, no one could name Traylon Burks. I mean, that's that's exactly. what this Arkansas team had. It, exactly, and Traylon Burks right now, I would say, is better than any wide receiver Auburn has currently. But mm -hmm. let's just say Kobe Hudson is that guy, and they have a nice tight end and uh, Shanker. But if the wide receivers can't catch over the you know the short to intermediate passes, it's going to be a long day for the Tigers. You saw them against LSU, and all year drop they have 16 drops this season and like over half of them are on like slants and crossing routes that mm. it can if that happens this weekend georgia is going to embarrass auburn and jordan hare stadium i mean you have to do something and the other thing is the wide receivers aren't explosive there is not a single wide receiver bryce that is averaging more than 15 yards per catch right now on oh. the auburn tigers team and on top of that, zero wide receivers are averaging more than eight yards after the catch. So they're it not just, making yeah. plays after they catch it. And for me, the, when when your leading pass catcher is John uh, Samuel Shanker at tight end, that's a serious problem, especially when you got mm -hmm. Demetrius Robertson, Kobe Hudson. Shedrick Jackson, I feel like, is a ninth-year senior, and he just caught his first <laughs> touchdown pass against Georgia State. It's, it's yeah. going to be a problem. And when you look at the secondary, I mentioned Ringo. I mentioned Kendrick. On top of Tyke Smith possibly coming back, you've got Chris Smith, Lewis Kine, Latavius Brini. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. They have seven picks. They don't allow any catches. For me, it is the – if I can envision a worse matchup for Auburn than Georgia, it, it would just be Georgia like Tom's too. I think mm -hmm. Auburn matches up better with Alabama right now than they yeah. match up with Georgia wow. mm. just personally because uh, Alabama's run game is a little bit less consistent than Georgia I would say and right now I just think Georgia's defense is that good I mean like you said it, they are on pace to be the best defense in college football history right now and they've what going on two straight shutouts now because they shut out Vandy and they shut out Arkansas. 99 to nothing in back-to-back -back yes. games that's and crazy it, if this game wasn't in Jordan Hare I think they would have a good shot of going three in a row. But mm. because it's in Jordan Hare, I would be – I can't remember the last time Auburn was shut out in Jordan Hare. It's yeah. been a long time. So, for me, that's what saves them. But for me, man, on my prediction, on my show, I had Georgia 28, Auburn 10 in this game. I just think – I think Georgia could score more. But like I told you, I think they're going to lean on the run game. This is going to be the chew the clock, chew the clock, chew the clock. And by the end of the game, you're going to be like – like I've been sitting here for like an hour and a half and nothing's <laughs> happened. That's that's exactly what Georgia wants. And I just think Auburn will have one drive probably early and a late field goal to put on the board. But I think Georgia controls this game from kickoff to the clock mm -hmm. hit zero. And for all my Auburn fans out there, I asked Bryce to invite me on when we play like South Carolina or UT Martin. <laughs> like that way I can, you know, at least show you all that I am an Auburn fan. Yeah. Like, the jerseys are real in the back. <laughs> no, and my prediction, you know, this is going to come out on Saturday morning, but it's much along the same lines. I mean, I felt like Auburn could get one touchdown on the board, and then Carlson's a really good kicker. Uh, my prediction was 34-13. Uh, I think that Georgia could do that. Maybe 21, and this is kind of how I envision it happening, 21 to seven and a half. I think Auburn feeds off the crowd energy. Maybe they even go up seven nothing. But it's really a game where you never feel like the game's quite in Auburn's favor. There's a fleeting moment where it's like, oh, is this going to be happening? And then quickly, much like a team in Alabama's done in recent years, Georgia takes that control back. 21 seven and a half. They add 10 more. Um, and then I think a couple late field goals from Carlson, because I do think Carlson is a guy that uh man, he he's he's a heck of a he's kicker. I mean, obviously his brother he's is very good. good, Daniel, but he's very good. Uh tell us where you can find us or where you can find you. They know people who are find <laughs> us, they're watching right now. Uh, where can they find you, your coverage? Obviously, Fly War Eagle as well. I mean, this is a game that has been well documented over there, Deep South's oldest rivalry. But man, where can they find Blue Bloods and uh, everything about you? Yeah, man, you can find us on YouTube. Just type in the Blue Bloods with the first search, or if you want the URL, it's like youtube.com 
Backscore C, Backscore the Blue Bloods. Uh, you can find us on there, man. Release two, three episodes a day, previews all week, and you know, daily content other than Saturday, because I know y'all are watching the games. Y'all don't want to watch this face <laughs> over the games, but man, appreciate it. And we're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all podcast streaming platforms, and it's just flywareagle.com. Shout out to MK, shout out to Andrew over there, man. Great content for Fly War Eagle, man, and I love working with them. So shout out to them. It's awesome indeed. Make sure to follow those as well. Make sure to follow us as well. Hit the subscribe button down there at the bottom of the page. Hit the notifications as well so you know when we go live. We're live Mondays and Wednesdays, 8 p.m. Eastern. And I'll say 7 p.m. Central for the people uh, across the Chattahoochee as well. And then if you're a Georgia Tech fan, you just stumbled upon this because you're like, hey, I wanted to kind of like what this guy says. Not many people say that, but maybe you did. <laughs> uh, Tuesday nights, obviously, 7.30. We got Swarm Talk where we talk about the Jackets, and they got a big game coming up this weekend. I appreciate it, Zach. It's fun as always. Go ahead and, uh, man, it's it's a great weekend in college football. To recap it, we both have Georgia winning, and I think you, we both had them covering the spread as well. So it's yep. something I think was set at 15 and a half. Uh, it's kind of lines moved, actually. Uh, but, man, it's, it's a fun time to be an SEC football fan because this is about as good as it gets, one of the best rivers in college football. We thank you for watching. Make sure to tune in next time. Uh, this has been your Game of the Week preview. How in here in me? Feel it home. The crowded food is coming on.